Shalom and welcome to Nourish Your Biblical Roots, Conversations with Yael. I'm your host, Yael Eckstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. On my weekly podcast, I invite thought leaders, authors, pastors, and other religious leaders, politicians, and influencers to share their views on Jewish-Christian relations, Israel, and other issues that are of key importance to people of faith. Today, I am so excited to welcome Eric Metaxas to the podcast. When I think of him, the word eclectic comes to mind. He's a man who wears many hats. Eric is the New York Times bestselling author of Bonhoeffer and many other books, including Is Atheism Dead?, Martin Luther, Amazing Grace, and his latest, Letter to the American Church. He's also written more than 30 children's books, including the bestseller Squanto and The Miracle of Thanksgiving, and It's Time to Sleep, My Love. His books have been translated into more than 25 languages. He's the host of Socrates in the City and the nationally syndicated Eric Metaxas radio show billed as the show about everything, which also airs as a weekly television program on TBN. He's conducted interviews with an incredibly wide mix of guests from the world of politics, religion, and entertainment, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and many other more publications. Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation today because I have seen your interviews with so many people. And every time I, I rewind it just to hear some of your thoughts two or three times to make sure that they are uh, going deep into my thoughts and my consciousness and my soul. Um, so I'm excited for the wisdom and guidance that's going to come out today. And you are a very interesting person. Your website says Eric has written for Veggie Tales, Chuck Colson, and the New York Times. Three things not ordinarily found in the same sentence. It seems like you've done a little bit of everything. You've authored children's books, books about religion and culture, humor books, and op-eds for prominent media outlets. Yes. You've a nationally syndicated radio show, and you've been featured by so many different guests with a variety of views, including politicians, entertainers, prominent religious figures. What would you say, and I could go on for more describing all the diversity and interestingness of your career, what would you say is the string that ties it all together? I would say God and mm. truth. Um, it's interesting because you know, eclectic is a nice word for it. Scattered would be a word that you could also use. Hey, Eric, you're, you're doing all over, the, you're all over the place. You need to choose. And at some point I realized, no, I don't. God made me this way. This is really who I am. I have genuinely eclectic uh, tastes and interests. And I, I think that, you know, when I, I came to faith seriously uh, in the God of the Bible in the, um, uh, in 1988. And at that point, I realized that I want to live my life to God's glory. And I want to give my, uh, my talents uh, over to him and say, God, I want you to lead me. And frankly, God has done that. And, and I look back, you know, people always say this, you look back and you can see it, you can't see it at the time. But there's no question in my mind that when I look back over my career, it all does have a thread. Um, and I think that it's interesting because particularly when you're talking about Christians and Jews, the Bonhoeffer book that I wrote, which I never planned to write, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I look back on it now and I realize God clearly had his hand on that book. I don't say that lightly, but that book, which is to me the ultimate example of, of what it means, why Christians love Jews and speak up for Jews, Bonhoeffer is the ultimate example of a man, a pastor in Nazi Germany, speaking out for the Jews. That book really changed my career. In other words, that that kind of opened a lot of doors and and made a lot of things happen. I wouldn't have a, a I wouldn't have been invited to be the speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast in 2012 if it hadn't been for that book. So it's interesting uh, for me that that book. Um, which is my longest book, uh, in many ways is somehow central in my career. But you're right. I mean, I've been all over the place. I've done a lot of, I joke around a lot. So some people think of me as, you know, goofball. But, you know, there's, there's, there are a lot of things that I write about very, very seriously. And the story of Bonhoeffer uh, is, is one of them. My most recent book, Letter to the American Church, is, you know, deadly serious because I think we're going through a, a very difficult time uh, right now in the world and in America. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place. I guess I, this is why I always want to shamelessly encourage people, please go to my website, ericmetaxas.com, so you can kind of see the different things, because otherwise... It, 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 it gets a little, it gets a little confusing, but it's just my name, ericmetaxas.com. Amazing. And um, I love how you say that the string that ties it all together is faith and God and truth, because that really in all the diverse interviews that I've seen of you, that really is the string that ties it together. You are passionate, you are faithful, and that comes through in everything you do, whether it's serious or silly. Um, and, and so as people of faith, we believe in the God of love and the God of peace and the God of life. We're told um, Rodef Shalom to chase after peace. We're told to um, cherish life. We're told in all these different areas to pray for peace, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I live in Israel, uh, made Aliyah around 18 years ago, have four kids who were born here and my daughter about to enter the army. Um, and, and all I've seen in these 18 years is one terror attack after another and so many hopes for peace that are then crushed. Um, and I think that's kind of changed in the past few years since the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, that of course I was there to witness that historic moment, and the Abraham Accords, which has changed the trajectory of the Middle East. As a man of faith, um, do you think that there will ever be peace in Jerusalem? Do you think the Abraham Accords have brought us one step closer? And what do you see um, could lead to an enduring peace between Israel and her Arab neighbors? Well, I have to you know, say very bluntly, I don't know. Um, but what I do know and this is why uh, I am a fan of uh, the nation of Israel. It's, it's, I don't mean to put it so lightly to say fan, but uh, an admirer of the nation of Israel is because that Israel understands that in order to have shalom, in order to have peace, sometimes you have to fight and you have to be willing to fight. Why? Because there is evil in this world. If you don't understand that there is evil in this world, evil will triumph. Uh, when you think about the Holocaust. Most of the world didn't want to believe when, when, when it was revealed what had been done. They, most people don't want to believe that human beings are capable of that. Um, most people want to pretend that if I just look the other way, the fact of the matter is that, you know, in order to live out one's faith, in order to be uh, on the side of what is good, you have to recognize there is such a thing as evil and you have to be willing to fight against it or to be prepared to fight against it. And it's one of the things that, as I say, I've admired about Israel. Israel understands that we have a right to exist uh, and we will fight. And there's something really beautiful about that. Uh, I, I, I just want to say that, you know, you, you have to sometimes you have to be either a little bit persecuted or a little bit attacked before you realize, oh, I, I have to fight. And I think that part of the problem with the church in America, and I, this is my latest book, Letter to the American Church, is they've become, you know, when you're so blessed, you take your eye off the ball, you think, oh, we don't have to ever have to fight, we can just be nice. That's not right. There are always evil forces that want to crush freedom. Uh, and I also think that there are, there are forces, you know, when we talk about evil, evil is at war with God. And when you're at war with God, you're at war with God's people. Uh, and, and I think that anybody who loves God needs to understand that there are evil forces uh, in the world, spiritual forces of evil that want to crush the people of God. And this is something that's simply true. And not to understand that uh, is not to understand the scripture, because it's, uh, it's at the heart of so many stories in scripture. And so I think that that's uh, something that, you know, if you love God, uh, you hate evil. Uh, but you understand there is evil and you need to you need to stand against it. And we're living in kind of unique times where I think a lot of people are waking up to that, that uh, especially, as I say in this book, Letter to the American Church, uh, you need to wake up to it. Otherwise, you're complicit with it. Bonhoeffer, you know, uh, probably didn't say say it, but he's often credited with the phrase silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to, to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. And I talk about the, the guilt of the German church that said, oh, it's not our job to speak up. Many of them didn't know what was happening, 
But a few prophetic voices like Bonhoeffer said, you need to stand and speak now. You need to fight against this now. And they, they kind of acted like, well, we're just going to take a neutral path. Who's to say what's really happening? And by the time they saw what was happening, it was too late. And so in my new book, Letter to the American Church, I'm saying the same thing to the American church, that when you see these things happening, you must speak. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. And in a way, the reason we've gotten to where things are now with madness on every front is because many, I'm speaking to my fellow Christians, have been silent, have been unwilling to stick their necks out and say, no, 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 this is wrong. We're not going to allow this. So uh, that's a, it's a theme that has become very central for me. Wow, that's a powerful statement. As you're as you're talking, I'm seeing that Bible verse in front of my eyes. Oave Hashem Sinura, lovers of the Lord reject, hate evil. And there aren't many places in the Bible where it says to hate. We're commanded to love our neighbor like ourselves, to um, be kind, of course, to the orphan and the widow and the stranger in the land. But we're told that you're supposed to hate evil if you love God. And as you're talking, it, it, it seems like it's such a privileged position to not have to deal with that other side of the Bible, to only deal with the love, love, love. It's because you've never had a terrorist living next door or people who want to kill right. your children because of their faith. Right. Um, that it's it's just as important to know when to love and to uh, give credit and to try to build up through this partnership. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together. But at the same time, we have to use our iron fist against evil. There's, there's no question about it. And again, I think that the more blessed you are, the more tempting it is to say, well, everything's fine. We've evolved past evil, you know, and the thing is, you know, when you're talking about the Holocaust and you say never again, I would say, why never again? Tell me what you have learned from that so that when something similar comes, you will stand against it. It's not just about wanting to annihilate the Jews. In other words, evil in any form uh, that is a rage against God and God's purposes, will you recognize it when it comes? It's not going to come, you know, with a, with, a, with a tiny mustache this time. It's going to come in a different way. Will you recognize it? When it comes, will you will you stand against it? Will you make the sacrifices that you pretend you would have made then? Um, because a lot of people then wanted to look the other way. It'll take care of itself. I really think that um, that's part of the problem. When you're really blessed, you kind of think, well, everything's fine. We don't we don't have to worry about those things anymore. And I think that um, that's a mistake. That that if you cherish what is good, you really do have to understand that it needs. Uh, protecting. It needs fighting for. I, I wrote a book about America called um, If You Can Keep It, The Forgotten Promise of American Liberty. And If You Can Keep It is about this idea that we in America who love freedom, we have to fight for freedom. We have to teach our children what is the meaning of freedom. Um, how do you get free? Uh, how, do you, how do you keep tyrants uh, from controlling you and enslaving you? Obviously, that's all through the scripture, the story of the Exodus, these are themes. And, and I really think that many Americans don't understand uh, that what we have in America, what you have in Israel, this is not normative around the world. And we have to understand it and cherish it and teach our children what it is and teach our children that people died so that we could have these freedoms. These freedoms didn't didn't come free. They, they're very, very costly. And so I think this is something that particularly in America, uh, a number of uh, decades have passed, and we have not been understanding how precious these things are, how people had to fight, and in many cases, die for them. Uh, and so that's, that, that's a very, very important thing. And that's, I think, why we are kind of uh, going through difficult times right now in many, many ways, because people have forgotten that I need to understand these things and I need to fight for these things. They're worth fighting for. Hmm. Eric, I, I'd love to ask you a personal question. Um, you, you speak unlike most Americans that I've spoken to um, with a real passion for understanding what could be, what could have been yeah. uh, before it happens and before maybe you've experienced it in your lifetime. Are there certain experiences or maybe then one experience that you can point to which led to this 
epiphany moment or shift in understanding this message that you have been preaching of what I hear is wake up, wake yeah. up before it's too late. How yeah. have you woken up from that slumber? Well, or it's, was, yeah. it's pretty simple. There's, I mean, there's really two answers and they're related. Okay. Um, number one is writing the book on Bonhoeffer. My book on Bonhoeffer, uh, it's called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. When I wrote that book, I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, I just knew that my mother grew up in Germany during that period. And when I found out that there was this pastor who, because of his love, his love of God as a Christian pastor, spoke out for the Jews bravely. I said, this was so inspiring, you know. And at some point I said, oh, I'm going to write a book about it. But I didn't know what I was getting into. And as I wrote the book on Bonhoeffer, I could sort of smell that the evil of the Nazis, something similar was in our future in America. I said, this didn't happen in a vacuum. These weren't uniquely evil people. These were deluded people. People can be deluded and, and, and can go along with a lie and become part of something profoundly evil, wicked. And when I, when I wrote that book, um, it made me realize that most people at the time, they wanted to look the other way. They didn't want to acknowledge what was happening. They said, I just want to, I just don't want to get in trouble, you know? And, and I think to myself, that's tremendously selfish. Uh, it is ultimately evil, but it happened. And it happened to people that I know because my mother was there. My grandmother was there. They experienced this. And so it, it gave me this this re this this uh, education in the sense that things can get infinitely worse than you think if you think things are fine because people in germany at the time thought things are fine you know this is a christian nation it's the nation of luther how bad can things get we're not gonna they had no idea of that they would descend into this hell and it's of course complicated but the other thing is my parents my mother as i said came from germany understood the world of the Nazis and and in some ways even worse because she was older when when the Soviets took over what became East Germany you know she was behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany the communist propaganda the evil of communism she lived that my father was in Greece where the communists tried to take over Greece and so my parents raised me in Queens New York I know you've been to Queens New York and they were, because they were immigrants to this nation, they knew what we have here is not normal. What we have here is a gift from God. What we have here is a blessing. The opportunities that we have in this country, the freedoms we have in this country, they didn't experience that. They knew that you can go very far from that and that you need to appreciate what you have. And so I wrote a book um, uh, pretty recently, two years ago, I guess, came out which is the story of my life uh, really up until I came to faith and it's called fish out of water. And it's these immigrant experiences of, you know, growing up with my, my mom and my dad who really are from the old country. And as a result of that, a lot of the stories are very funny, you know, crazy, funny stories, but also there's a theme in there that they, they came from someplace and they raised their kids, even without trying very hard the way they raised us, we knew, that America is, is special. This is not normal. This is a great blessing that we get to be here and we didn't grow up the way my mother and father did. So, so the Bonhoeffer book uh, and just the story of growing up, which I write about in my more recent book, um, Fish Out of Water, in a way kind of made me who I am so that when these things have been happening in recent years, I'm trying to tell people, hey, you need to wake up. You need to be part of the fight uh, against evil, and you should not be afraid to speak out. Because if you're afraid to speak out, if you're silent, you're contributing to things going in the wrong direction, which they are very dramatically. Powerful words. So it, it's making me think about the reality that it seems is happening, according to all data and statistics and social movements, um, that the older generation of Christians and Americans, uh, specifically who saw the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948, that miracle, and who were alive to remember the 1967 war where everyone thought Israel was going to be wiped into the sea. That was it. That was a nice trial, but Israel's done with. And instead, Israel won 
uh, Jerusalem and more territory in six days against all odds by the miracles of God. And when it, the whole world was looking, what's Israel going to do to the Arabs in the land that they conquered? Israel gave them citizenship and equal rights. Um, so for the older generation, they understand the miracle of Israel, the value of Israel, the freedom in Israel. That's not a given, like what you're speaking about that your parents experienced in Germany and Greece coming to America. Um, but the younger generation, just like you're saying, the younger generation in America maybe has uh, forgotten that those freedoms are not free nor are given. It seems like the younger generation has also forgotten what a miracle of Israel is, the freedoms that Israel gives to all people in the country. And there's a movement of the younger generation, even within the Christian community, to not stand with Israel, to not back Israel. Yeah. Do you see this trend and what can we do against it? Well, ultimately, um, I have to say that, you know, th those who would stand against Israel, those who hate America, they are at war with God because God utterly miraculously called Israel into existence in 1948. Anybody who knows the story knows this is a miracle. It's practically proof of God if you're looking for evidence for God. But I would say the same thing about the United States. The United States ought not to exist. A nation that proclaims freedom to the world, that believes in religious liberty, that says you can be an atheist, you can be anything. Uh, George Washington, his letter to the Truro Synagogue. I mean, these are biblical values, these ideas of tremendous freedom, freedom for all, freedom with people with whom we disagree. These are beautiful biblical values. They are from God. They do not arise naturally out of human beings. Human beings uh, naturally are, can be tribalist monsters. We need God to lead us into these values. And then when you realize that these values produce the United States of America, these values produced Israel, there's something beautiful and sacred and precious here, and we must teach our kids and tell our neighbors that these things are beautiful and good and true, and we have forgotten, and I really do think that in America, it's the same story, that there were many generations of Americans who kind of understood this, that, that, that we need to fight for freedom, that this is a rare thing, but in, you know, let's say in the last 50 years, we've kind of acted like, well, everything's fine, you know, we don't have any, uh, you know, we're not going to have a depression or World War II or we're not, you know, everything's kind of okay. We don't need to really fight. We don't need to understand what's beautiful and good and true and fight for it. We, we've kind of evolved to a point where everything's, everything's good. And you realize, no, uh, absolutely not. And as a result of that complacency, things have been sliding in the opposite direction. And so you're seeing open anti-Semitism, vicious uh, anti-Americanism, people who are ignorant of history, but who have this uh, really emotional animus against ultimately God, the people of God, the values of God, you're seeing it uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, people who hate, uh, who hate reality, who hate God's nature, they, they want to somehow, you know, be as gods themselves, as you know, the, the promise in the first pages of Genesis, you can be as gods. So that's kind of what we're dealing with again and again through history, but we're dealing with it right now. And it's incumbent on us who see it to speak out loudly and to, to warn those who could be warned, who could be, who could be awakened. Some people will choose to continue sleeping, but we, we have an obligation to those who might be awakened to do what we can to wake them up. It's like the prophets who were screaming, the temple is going to be destroyed. You have yeah. to repent. And everyone yes. said, oh, well, we've had the temple for hundreds of years. It's going to be destroyed now. And, and eventually that if we don't heed our call, um, then it, the temple's destroyed, whatever that temple is, whether it's a home between a marriage or children or uh, in countries and governments, if we're not heeding our call and both putting our hand out in peace while protecting our rights and our sovereignty and our freedoms, then everything falls apart. There's a saying, Hashem oz le'amo yiten, Hashem yivarech et amo bashalom. God is the God of strength and fights with strength. He is the Lord of peace, that, that you need both of them. And you are um, spreading some important messages. I have a question for you um, from the place that you've interviewed so many people. Are there any interviews? I've seen you have a lot of fun on interviews. Are, are there any interviews that stand out as, wow, that was fun. That was exceptional. And is there anyone you haven't interviewed that you hope one day you'll be able to? 
Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I do um, the Eric Metaxas show. It's, it's a national radio show. Uh, some of it appears on TBN. We put everything on Rumble. Uh, all my interviews are on Rumble, which is why I tell people, please go to ericmetaxas.com and sign up. So I've interviewed tons of people that way, but I also do something you mentioned at the beginning called Socrates in the City, which is more long form interviews. It's almost like a PBS kind of thing. And I have had uh, through Socrates in the City, some of the most fascinating figures. Um, a year ago, I had a beautiful conversation with Apollo 16 astronaut, uh, Charlie Duke. Uh, he walked on the moon, now it's 51 years ago. One of the most fascinating conversations I have ever had. Uh, people can find it at socratesinthecity.com. More recently, I had a, a long conversation with Yomi Park, who escaped North Korea. Uh, it is one of the most chilling, powerful conversations I have ever had. Uh, again, people can find it on YouTube, Socrates in the City. But to talk to people who've experienced things like walking on the moon or escaping North Korea, it's, it's such a harrowing story, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you. But I, I just think that these conversations are, are very, very important. And uh, I have in, interviewed some amazing people, but there are tons of people that I I still haven't interviewed or and 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 want to interview. I wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, where where, where do I begin? Uh, there 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 are people. I love the world of entertainment, so I love talking to people who've been in show business. Uh, I've spoken to tons of them over the years. I've had many conversations with Pat Boone, uh, who knew everybody. You can't think of anybody in Hollywood that he wasn't friends with. He was friends with Ronald Reagan. Um, my friend Dick Cavett, uh, I've interviewed him a number of times. He he knew everyone, so it's it's fun for me to talk um, about to people who are in the in the entertainment business, in the entertainment world, in the film business, uh, singers, comedians. So I'm I really am eclectic. You know, I, I I'm not I'm not faking it. I think it would be tough to fake uh, being eclectic, but I I just I enjoy it, and I and I think that it's actually important. So. You know, I'm I'm grateful that you, that you would ask me that. I I I couldn't begin to tell you how many people there are that I haven't yet interviewed that I would want to interview. So we'll see we'll see how that works. But I I, uh, I I I hope I get to do what I'm doing for you know a really long time because there's a long list. Amen. Yeah, Pat Boone is a very close friend of ours as well. He was on my podcast just a, a month or two ago, which you could find in the podcast list as well. And that was a fun interview with lots of singing and serenading and stories. He, we were in Israel together. He came to Israel with the fellowship uh, a few years ago, and that was also an incredible tour of the Holy Land through different eyes. So I can understand exactly what you're talking about when, when you refer to the entertainment industry as a whole different yeah. view as a person of faith, a especially being in the entertainment industry. Yeah. It's just a whole nother uh, area that's inspiring in and of itself. Eric, I could talk to you forever, um, but I am mindful of your time. And so I'd like to ask with one question that I ask all of my guests, you juggle so much in life. Um, you juggle so much in your professional life and your personal life and your faithful life and your political life. Do you have one Bible go-to verse that gives you strength on those days where you just feel like you have nothing left? Well, um, there are probably two that I, that, that I go to. One is uh, in the uh, Paul's letter um, uh, to the Philippians in Philippi in Greece, where my family's from, not Philippi, but my family's from Greece. He, he says uh, it, the, the word, and I, I believe it's the word of God. This is not Paul speaking. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. That idea that God loves us so much, he says, I don't want you to be anxious or worried about anything. When you have a problem, you come to me and you bring it to me in prayer and I'm your heavenly father. And I think that there is a temptation to fret. Uh, you know, there's the other scripture, do not fret because of evildoers, which is in the, in the Psalms. I mean, we are commanded by God who loves us to take our problems to him, to trust in him with our whole heart. And this is a, a, a not just a daily battle, but a, but a, 
moment by moment battle. Am I trusting God or am I letting uh, evil or difficult things rattle me? Um, so that's, that's an important scripture, which is Philippians 4, 6, I think. And then the other one is Romans 8, 28. It says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. The idea is that the worst thing that could happen, God says that if you love me and are called according to my purposes, I can weave even these horrible things into something beautiful in the end. And we need to know that that's who God really is. That's the God of the scripture. And we need to remind ourselves, uh, all of us need to, because life is tough and there is evil. And so, uh, you know, thank you for reminding me uh, of those two scriptures, because those are the ones that I um, think about rather often. How comforting and what a wonderful way to end. Eric Metaxas, thank you so much. And everybody go to his website where you can see all the different interviews and books and ideas and YouTube videos that he's been referring to, um, you should watch them in full. So go to Eric Metaxas website. And from there, you can see all of his incredible works that he's sharing with the world. Thank you so much, Eric. God bless you. My privilege. Thank you.